just so that you're not distracted. Yes, I changed. Let's move on. All right. I got wet. So I uh, want to invite you to turn your Bibles to, as I said before, the book of Colossians. I guess you could say that this is our first sermon series in which we are intending to go through the entire book of uh, a book in the Bible from start to finish. And if you if you didn't uh, bring a Bible, if you forgot a Bible, we've got a bunch at the back. Maybe you missed them when you came in. Does anyone need one? Because we're going to be in the Bible here right now. It's probably going to be really helpful if you have one. Anyone? Carolyn's handing out there. Anybody else? And if you don't have a Bible, and so that's why you didn't bring one, you get to keep this one if you want. Anyone else? No? Okay. All right, so yeah, the book of Colossians. Excited for this uh, chance for us to start to finish, Lord willing, through an entire book in the Bible. And so brings us to Colossians chapter 1 this morning. Uh, The title of the sermon is Thankful Prayer for Your Faith in Christ. The whole sermon series, and maybe you saw it, uh, already, maybe social media, but or on the website. But the sermon series title is Christ Over Us. I'll explain that in a moment. But we find ourselves in uh, the book of Colossians and uh, verses 1 to 8. I want to read those verses for you, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into it. So uh, let me read, if you'd follow along in your copy of God's Word, Colossians chapter 1, in the first eight verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in the church, er, sorry, in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ uh, Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing, as it does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our fellow, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So the word of the Lord. Let me pray, if you pray with me, and then let's get into it. So pray. Father, we, uh, again, as always, Lord, we pray that we would humbly come. We humbly come, but Lord, would it be hearts that are humble and willing to receive your word. Father, I pray that you would strengthen your church. I pray, Father, that you would counsel your church. You would shepherd your church. Open our eyes, Lord, to the truth of the word. Father, that each one here could say, I I see it. it. It's so plain. It's right there. And Lord, that you would direct each one. And again, us collectively as a church, Lord, would you speak through me, Lord, just as a servant. Father, would I be humble, or through the entire sermon, would you keep me free from distractions? Fill me with your spirit to make much of Christ. And so, Father, we're so uh, looking forward to being able to go through this book, Colossians, and just understanding what does it mean that Christ is over us or to be over us. And so, Father, prep us now. Would we start well? And, Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, question for you, and maybe, I don't know if I always do this or not, but I'm I'm doing it this morning, so I want to ask you a question. When you thank God for others in prayer, particularly in prayer, you're praying for others, and you're thanking God for them, what do you thank Him for? So when you pray for others and you thank the Lord for them, what are you thanking Him for? I want you to think about that. What typically does your prayer look like as you thank the Lord for someone else, particularly your brothers and sisters in Christ? Maybe it's um, you thank the Lord for their help, uh, their hospitality, their kindness, their friendship. And, and just to be clear, that's good. That is good, that's normal. But maybe that's the only things that you thank the Lord for regarding your brothers and sisters. And maybe, and man, I've been challenged as I've gone through this passage, maybe there's some things here that we ought to be thanking the Lord for always. Some of those things maybe change, but maybe there's some things we need to thank the Lord for always. So if, especially, and I would say, if you're concerned 
for a brother. If you're concerned now, I mean, maybe you're thankful you had a good time, brother or sister, you thank the Lord. Now what if you're concerned for this brother or sister? Do you thank the Lord for them? And if you do, what do you pray? And again, really challenged for me. Would it be appropriate to start a prayer for a brother or sister you're concerned for with thanksgiving? Would that even be appropriate? Well, that's what Paul does here for an entire church. So man, really challenging for me. A good, a good word for me for sure. And so, I want to give you some background. What are we reading here? What's the book of Colossians about? Well, Paul writes this letter to the Colossians, to a church in Colossae. Now, he's greatly concerned for them. I'll explain why in a moment. But again, to be, to be clear, he's writing a letter to a church. And he is greatly concerned and he starts the letter with what he starts with, what we just read, with some p- particular things, some topics of thanksgiving, which is interesting. Paul's own situation is less than ideal. We looked at the book of Ephesians, again, another prison epistle. He's in, on, in house arrest. So he's in prison, imprisoned in a sense. There's some, some freedom in house arrest that he can have visitors and people can come and go and he can preach the gospel there, though... He's still in house arrest, and it's by Rome, and so he could die at any moment. They could say, you know what, it's time. And that later does happen, actually. But he has this period of house arrest where he's there for two years, and in that, it's, oh, it's interesting to me, he's thinking about the church, even to write a letter. But yeah, there's concern. Oh, yeah, 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 but, but he's thinking about thanksgiving. He's thanking the Lord for them. He starts the letter this way. That's, that's a big deal. Though he's in prison, and Paul gets this news, we know, of the Corinthian church from Epaphras, or Epaphroditus. I don't know if he's just like, that's like short form. He's like, hey, Epaphras, how's it going? Because Epaphroditus is just like wordy, I don't know. He knows Epaphras well, and Epaphras come to visit him, and he's like, look, let me tell you about the church. I got some concerns. And so he's done this, he's got word from Epaphras, and, and likely Epaphras was a convert, we don't know for sure, but likely a convert from Paul's preaching, Epaphras went back to his hometown, Edmonton, Colossae, right? He, and he talks to these believers. A church starts, a church is planted, and Epaphras is actually a key part in their learning and teaching and shepherding. And Epaphras is bringing this news to a church Paul doesn't even know. He's never, he knows about the church, but he's never seen them. He's never visited them. In a sense, they're strangers. And still, he starts this letter thanking the Lord for them. And I want you to know that's a big deal. So it isn't just people he's like really, really close with. Now the whole letters of Colossians, we've got four chapters that it's broken up into, but the whole letter, the whole book is not just a long, thankful prayer. There's some stuff Paul's going to get to. But he starts that way. And again, it's significant that he starts that way. The whole letter actually drives the nail home that Christ is supreme over all. He's like, you have to know from this letter That Christ rules over all, and that's our sermon series. He rules over us as a church. And he's driving that nail home, but again, he starts with thanksgiving. Now, it's interesting as we look at the whole of the letter, Christ over us, he's concerned because there's some teaching. Really, it's like Christ isn't over us. It's really the teaching if you want to sum it up. But we get hints of it. We don't know for sure what the issue was. He doesn't say it really plainly. But we get hints of it. But it's really interesting because every hint, and I'll show you through the book, hey, there's an issue. Hey, Redemption Church, just be careful. Here's some things you need to know that's being taught around you. Well, he's saying that to the church, and the hints always clarify Christ over us. Be careful of this, and let me explain how Christ is awesome. Always. And so three hints that, that, um, that I see anyhow. Uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Again, not exclusively, but that would maybe help sum it up. But he's talking about this empty philosophy. This empty philosophy. So, really then, the fact is, Christ is over every philosophy. Christ is over every rule and every authority. He's over it. He, so we get a hint of, like, well, what exactly is this empty philosophy? I don't know for sure, but he's like, you just need to know Christ is over it. That's what you need to know, church. I think today, like for us, well, what would be empty philosophy? I think of secular counseling, quite honestly. Psychology is empty. It's empty and it's dead. Unless it agrees with the Word of God. 
And not just like, well, I, I mean, I guess it agrees, but then it misses the whole point of biblical theology and it doesn't agree with the point of it. It's like, well, God wants you to be at peace, doesn't he? So, no, 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 but what's the whole point? Like the glory of God making disciples. It's an empty philosophy if it does not agree with the word of the supreme one of God, Christ. And he's saying, you just need to know, we don't need to get into the weeds of all the emptiness of it and, and the the different variations and angles, let's talk about Christ and how supreme he is. Secondly, we know it had something to do with rituals. Chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. He talks about, here's the fact. You've got these rituals, and some of them are leading you astray. They are shadows, he says, of the substance. So no, Christ is the, he rules. He's the substance of these rituals. The, the rituals aren't necessarily wrong, but they're a shadow and you're treating them like they're the substance. Christ rules. He's the substance. Any ritual that's worth keeping will be commanded by the word of Christ. And I'll say this. Any ritual that we do then, commanded by the word of Christ, do this church, will reinforce the substance who is Christ. So have we, do I have any rituals in this church that we believe God's commanded us to do? Yeah. Yeah. Right? There's a giant horse trough here with like 250 gallons of water. Yes. And, and, and why do we love the ritual? Because we're like, well, you know, maybe there's something to that. Maybe that solidified something for these guys. Maybe, maybe they're more secure. No. No, God help us. No, no, no. This ritual is a shadow of the substance. Who is Christ and the work he's already done in them. And so Paul's like, look, there's all these rituals and we're not sure exactly all of them. We get different flavors, but always again, reinforcing the substance. And then third, chapter 2 again, verses 18 and 19, really speaking of like signs and wonders. Seems this teaching, and remember, this is amongst them. It's not knock, knock, knock. Oh, who's there? Someone comes in, we're like, they're crazy. No, no, this is like, this is in amongst them and, and certainly being led by their leadership on some level, signs and wonders. Talks about worshiping angels. Obsessed with visions. Isn't he a sign from God? He says, the fact is Christ is over every angel. He's over every vision. He's over every dream. You can have the most insane event happen in your life. The most supernatural, unexplainable thing happen. It means nothing unless it agrees with, again, the word of Christ. Interpreted by that. Always. Through the word of Christ. This dangerous teaching, again, was it was in their midst. It was, I would say, hard to pinpoint and subtle. And the hope for the Colossian church, again, he starts with thanksgiving. Really interesting. But the hope is, look, you need to know. And so I would say this to us, too. The Holy Spirit of God wants us to know Christ rules. He rules. He needs to rule this church always. Uh, Curtis Vaughn, I think we'll have the quote on here, commentator, he says this. It did not, he's speaking of this heresy, Again, we're not sure exactly, but he says, well, we know this. It did not deny Christ, but it did dethrone him. Right? Satan doesn't deny Christ, but Satan dethrones him. My sinful flesh wants to do that too. This is why it's so dangerous. It was when the, within their midst, and so, again, he says, it did not, this heresy did not deny Christ, but it did dethrone him. It gave Christ a place, but not the supreme place. The Christian facade made the Colossian error all the more dangerous. I think we're doing it. I think we're okay. The name of Christ is being shared lots. But he's lost his place. I mean, in our hearts, you would say. So again, Paul, kind of knowing this, before he dives into it, he pauses and he thanks the Lord for them. I don't know about you, but to me that's like, man, we don't even have time for that. And, it, and it's obviously sincere. Like, so, so why? Well, this leads us to our big idea for these verses, but there's always some things that we will be thankful for. The big idea, we will always pray thankful for this. There's some things we're always thankful for, and we're going to see a couple in this passage. We will always pray thankful for this. And the first one, now three points, but the first point is a long point. So I don't want you to be distracted thinking, doing the math, and then we're never leaving. That's the only reason I mention that. First point's a longer point, and then two quick ones. But the first one, this, you're living for Christ. 
So we will always be, uh, always pray thankful for this. You are living for Christ. So he says, verse 1, and you can see it there. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So, that's an interesting way to start your letter. Usually it's like, dear church, hi, I'm Kyle. I got some things to say. Maybe. Why is he giving all these details? It's like, hey, doctor so-and-so maybe, or like, what's the deal? Well, he has, and I would say this, a Christ-defined view as he's writing so concerned for these believers of himself and then Timothy who's with him and then the church. It's a Christ-defined view. He says he's an apostle. That's who he is, you could say. Not just his title, it's almost like his character. He's sent with authority from Christ. So he knows who he is. Timothy, he says he's Paul's brother. Though we know later in Scripture, he's like a son to him. But yet he's a fellow servant with Christ and with, Tim, or with Paul. And then the church members, he says, and you can see it there. How does he describe them? Faithful saints. Faithful saints. So, so he's not just saying, hey, Redemption Church. He's kind of giving some definition to it, and it's, it's a Christ-defined view. Saints being set apart. Maybe you, hopefully you saw a bit of that in the testimonies and as we look through baptism. Set apart. Why, set, saints? Well, no one is a saint apart from Christ, who is the saint. Saints, no, sinners, but forgiven and then credited the righteousness of Christ, the, the sainthood of Christ, the firstborn from the dead. And so, saints, yes, set apart by their faith, and then faithful brothers. So, interesting, again, he didn't say, hey, um, you're vulnerable brothers, brothers in danger. Though that's true, he thanks the Lord that they're faithful brothers. This is who they are. So, do we view others with a Christ-defined view. This is good for me to think of. When I think for you, church, think of you. When I pray for you, man, I've been challenged. Do I have this, this Christ-defined view of myself and you? If I'm praying for someone thankful, the first thing that has to come into my mind, first of all, is do they know Christ? Are they in Christ? And I'm praying for their salvation. Now, if they're in Christ, I'm thanking them for that reality. Paul seems to be like he can't go away from that. He always needs to start there. How many times when you're addressing someone, have you ever been addressed before by a full name? Some of you, when you're in trouble, get told your full name. Some of you are like shuddering right now. You're like, please don't say it. It brings back really bad memories, right? You're addressed a certain way, and I actually don't know exactly why we do that. First, middle, last name, or full name. Right, but you're being addressed by, say, parents, you're addressing your kid, or you say, here's your full name. Well, what are you actually saying about them? I don't know. Maybe you need to think about that. Or, or you're speaking of them, or you're speaking to them, and you're such a... I speak of others, they are such a... It is good for us to pause and say, hang on, what do we know for sure? Who are they actually? They might be living a certain way, but who are they? And it matters so much. Who are we actually talking to here? It changes, then, our prayer for them. So Paul remembers first who this church is. There's, we're not a healthy church, but he remembers some reality of who they are. And then verse 3 he says, And we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. He says always, not just on Tuesdays or Sundays, or we had that good potluck, which is going to be next Sunday, by the way. He says always. But there's trouble stirring in the church. Like there's a culture change happening and he's like, no, we, we always thank the Lord for you. And so there's three things that we know for sure that he's thankful for always. And you can see them here. Verses 4 to 5. Okay, so like this is like constant, always, never stopping. Verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So there it is. Your faith. That's the first one. And of the second, love that you have for all the saints. And then verse 5, the first part of there, because of the hope, there's the third one. Faith, love, 
and then because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. He's thankful for faith, love, and hope, and he says, I'm always thanking the Lord for this, for you. Man, I need to change my prayer life for you as a church, for brothers and sisters in my life. Am I thanking God for this? It's a good question. So this wasn't just a Colossian church thing either. If you're like, yeah, but they were probably extra special or whatever. And we see almost the exact same thing with the church in Thessalonica. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he does almost the exact same thing. He says, we give thanks to you. And I don't think he's just like, we know. He's writing scripture. This is the word of God. He's not just like, this is kind of how I start my letter. This is how I just always pray. No, there's intention here. We give thanks. So he's thankful again to God Always, he says, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2-3, to three, always for all of you. So, constantly, he says, mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your, listen, work of faith and labor of, there it is, the second one, love, and steadfastness of, and there it is, the third, hope. Your hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he starts the letter there too. This other church, and he's praying thankful for the same thing. Like, what would unite that? Well, I'll tell you what would unite it. Christ. It's the same gospel. We get somebody else up here for baptism. It's not going to be like, well, we're kind of celebrating something different. We're thankful for the same things. So he's thankful for these three things always. And if you're taking notes, it probably would be helpful for you to write those three down. He's thankful for their faith, so let's just look at that. What does he mean? Well, he's thankful for their lifestyle. He's thankful for how they live out the Christian faith. He's not so thankful that they just have faith. I'm thankful for your generic, subjective faith. He's very plain on what it is in Christ. So he's thinking of their faith in Christ. That is like in Christ, grounded in Christ, united in Christ, however you want to say it. It directs their thoughts and their actions, their desires. And he says, man, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for your living out your life in Christ. Third John 4 says, I have no greater joy. Interesting. John says, no greater joy. Man, there's a lot of things I'm thankful for and joyful in. He says, he has no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. It's like, I thank the Lord for your faith in Christ. To be clear, I'm not thankful that you just have faith. Everyone has faith. Faith in Christ. Second, he's, again, just to explain, thankful for their love. So he's thinking a particular type of love. This word, many of us, I think it's been a pretty popular one to speak of agape, but it's this, this love he's speaking of is this, it's very clear, it's a committed, sacrificial, like unending, not based on feelings, love. This is like the deepest love you can have for someone, and And he's thanking, so again, he's thanking the Lord for this church in Colossae that they have this love. Selfless, deep love. And he says, for who? For the saints. Those who are set apart. Now, this is a love then, not just for the athletes. I just love hanging out with the jocks. It's not this deep love for, for the athletic or the single or the married. Or the artistic. Now, it's really easy for us. We understand this. Kind of birds of a feather flock together, right? And it's easy for us to be like, man, I really love these dudes or (laughs) these chicks, right? Like, I really love hanging out with these people, this group. To be clear again, it's not the musicians. It's not the white collar, blue collar. He says, I'm thankful that you have a love for those who are in Christ. Love for the saints. All of them, he says. And that's true, too. Not just some of them. It's like, I don't know about the other ones, man. Again, he doesn't even know the church in Colossae. Like, is that our love amongst each other as we maybe don't don't even know names of one another? He says again, he's thinking of this deep love for all the saints, not just the ones that aren't annoying. It's kind of interesting. It's that uh, I think we get this. I think it's hard for us. It's hard for me to understand this with, uh, we could talk about like this supernatural family, the body of Christ. But we see it, don't we, in like the biological family, right? You could say saints and brothers and sisters, he uses that term. Man, there is a type of love that's committed or ought to be within family 
that has kept many of our families together when otherwise we'd be like, I'm done with you. And some of the families that are broken up, that it's gut-wrenching. Why? Because they're family. That maybe gives you an idea, like a mother's love for a child. There's a connection, and he's saying you have a deep love for anyone who's a saint as you are a saint in Christ. And that is my prayer for us, church, is that we would love one another that way, that we begin to think of one another differently. We have to, uh, Galatians 6.10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And listen, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Wow. Especially them. There's a love that is different. It's not that you don't love your neighbors, but there is a love that is different and deeper of brothers and sisters. And Paul's like, man, I thank the Lord for that. And then he, thirdly, hope again. Thankful for their hope. When he says hope, he means that's just like sure it's going to happen, guaranteed, and so you're putting all your eggs in that basket. Hope. It's laid up for them. That means continually. That word is continually laid up. It's always there, never to be lost. It's like you might have it today, not tomorrow. He's just thankful that they have this continually. This continual hope of their salvation, their reward, their relationship with Christ. And he's thankful for their hope. Why? Because it motivates their faith and their love. Look at verse 5. He says, because of the hope. He says, because of. I'm thankful for your faith and love because of the hope that you have. The hope that they had motivated them to have faith and love for one another. I had a friend um, I used to hang out with a lot. And he said to me once at coffee, coffee time, we're just having a coffee together, and, and he had said this often. He says, I like to think that my hope is not secure. I like to think that I could lose my relationship with God. That this thing that God did is maybe something that could be lost. And the reason I like to think that way is because that keeps me following God because I'm scared I might lose it. And I said to my friend, I said, the first problem with that is you've got to show me where that's in the Word of God. Second of all, that doesn't give glory to God because what he starts, he finishes. And third, fear is not a good motivation. And it won't work. And I'll tell you this, it didn't work for my friend. It's not working for him. Worship is your motivation. He says he loves their hope in Christ because it is motivating their faith and motivating their love. No, they are sure of their faith. If you are sure of your faith in Christ, for my friend, I would say, then that will motivate your service to God. It is rock steady, can't lose it, because that, first of all, is true, and that actually motivates then a living out of that faith for the Lord, out of worship for God. And then if you are sure of your love from God, then you can love others. If you're unsure and you're like, I just don't know if God loves me today, good luck loving others. All you will do in those moments is try to get love from somebody else because you're just not sure you have it. What motivates love is knowing the love of God for you in Christ. So Paul knows this. This is why we say this at the end of the service. I'm not paid to say that, by the way, or it's not like in some job description that at the end of the service, some of you know what we say. We say you're dismissed. We also say right before that, you are loved. Redemption Church, to be clear, I actually say Redemption Church, you are loved, meaning there's a particular love for this church from the Lord as those who are in Christ, and I want to remind you of that. And as you're reminded of that as you go, that will motivate your love for others and strengthen your faith in the Lord. And it leads us, then, I would say, too, to compassion for the saints in love. There's a compassion you can only have for one another when we remember the love God had for us and where we came from. It's something that so struck me when I was dealing with people through counseling. I had so many different situations. These people are so different. How How can I love them? I didn't even know them. But when I remember the gospel, I remember it doesn't matter their situation, how different they are, their background, or how deep the mud is that they're in. Their heart is the exact same as mine without the Lord. Their hope is the exact same that I need in Christ. No different. And it gives you a compassion of love for each other. And so Paul is thankful for these things. So that's our our first point. 
being he says, man, I'm always thankful for your living for Christ. And again, right, your faith, your love, and your hope. Second point, he's always thankful for their beginning. So we'll always pray thankful for your beginning with Christ, your beginning. Look at verse 5, last part to verse 5 there. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Verse 6, which has come to you. He's thinking of their beginning. He's thinking of when they came to become saints. You heard the word of truth, the gospel. He says, the word to his making. Again, Christ supreme. He's not, Christ isn't just giving you and I a word today. You can say, I got a word from the Lord. It's the word, though. And so he's thanking them. I remember when you heard the word, there's no other word. We sang it today. There is one gospel to which I cling, all else I count as loss. I won't sing that for you. We sang it together. I don't know if you realize you were singing that. There is one gospel to which I cling, all else I count as loss. Remembering coming to Christ, one gospel, one truth, one word, one Savior, one Lord, ruler of all, Christ. And Paul's remembering this and he's thanking the Lord. I mean, I remember where you came from. I remember your start. And he's also thankful because he's remembering that someone preached to them. He's thinking even, and maybe he knows then of who preached, and he does in this case, Epaphras. He was that person that brought the word to the church. And so Paul knew that. He knew their beginning. Now, if that's going to be the case for us, if you're going to pray for one another, if we're going to pray as a church for one another in, in thankfulness, then we need to know our story. I think it's a fitting thing to ask then, like, what's your beginning? We got to hear a couple today in baptism. Praise the Lord. It helps me thank the Lord for those guys in prayer. But like maybe we need to start, and I wouldn't say not maybe, we need to, to ask. If you're like, I just don't know what to talk about a coffee talk with my, you know, my church friends. Where'd you start? What's your beginning? And, and I would add to that too to say, uh, brother and sister, you need to begin by saying, hey, can I just tell you where I came from? And we're talking about salvation. We're talking about your faith in Christ. Why? Well, I would say at the very least, so that they can pray for you with thankfulness. Remembering, oh, who is that preacher? Where did you hear that? Someone preached them. He's remembering this. And then he continues on. He's thankful for the truth that they have, uh, that others have heard. He's kind of going now beyond as he's thanking for them. And he's like, man, but this has gone beyond. Look at verse 6. As indeed in the whole world, it's bearing fruit and it's increasing. So he's not just thanking them. Hey, you had a beginning and other people are having beginnings all over the world. So it doesn't mean like exhaustively, it's just like the idea is it's going everywhere. But it's that, it's, look at it, he says, bearing fruit. Now we've got, and kids, there'll be a picture up for you. This is helpful, hopefully, for you. Some of you maybe know what this is. This is gout weed. There's maybe other words for it. I think it's a fitting word. Um, it's actually not bad as a ground cover plant. Gout weed spreads really well. I'm pulling a bunch of gout weed out of my front yard right now. Why? Well, it spreads really well, but it doesn't bear fruit. It just covers a lot of ground. It doesn't bear fruit, and because of that, we're tearing it out. If it bear fruit, I love gardening, actually, and I have gout weed all through the garden. It grows like crazy, spreads like crazy. But I'm more interested in something that spreads and then also bears fruit, and this is what Paul's talking about. Like we don't need just conversions. And I thank the Lord that you came to Christ. I don't, I'm not thinking past that. No, no, no. We don't need just conversions. We actually need worshipers of Christ everywhere. Not just a bunch of converts. Paul's not just thinking, man, I'm glad it's spreading. He's like, no, no, no. God's getting worship. It's bearing fruit in the lives of these people. And he talks in the beginning, remember, of like peace, grace, and peace. And so guaranteed as he's thinking fruit he's thinking that like the gospel life and so where there was unbelief there's belief like the gospel in your life isn't just belief then and now you're saved and you're not going to hell i've said it before it's like you have god and now the more and more it's bearing fruit in your life you're living less and less like an atheist or a heathen or a pagan living less and less in unbelief and more in belief i'm still doing this what am i saying that's not even true why am I believing that? And he's saying it's increasing. It's increasing. So where there's unbelief, there's belief. 
Where there's lust, there's now growing contentment. Fear, there's peace. Anger, self-pity, despair, there's gratitude, self-control, love, joy, hope, right? Hope of the world. So Paul's thanking for this beginning. And I think it's fitting, man. Fitting that we'd be talking about being thankful for beginnings when we had baptism Sunday. But he's also thinking that it's bearing fruit. We can't just be thankful just for Ryan and Weston and Kai that they're saved. He says, as it does among you, so it goes on, it's like it's, it's actually doing something among you. It went everywhere bearing fruit, but he says, this is happening here. It's spreading and it's bearing fruit right in this church since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So again, as you're thinking, and I would just say of like uh, Kai, Ryan, and Weston, put them on the spot because they were just baptized. Very clear illustration of a beginning. It's actually illustrating a new birth. Would you thank the Lord for that? But when you pray for them, would you thank the Lord for their faith in Christ? Would you thank the Lord that, man, there's going to be fruit growing, Lord. Like, you're going to do the work. Like, do more of it, but you're going to do the work. There's, there's fruit now. There's life change that... It can't even be described. We can't even like put it in a box. It's all good and glorious and that we would pray this way for our brothers. Thankful for beginnings. I would say too, just before moving moving to our last point, uh, when we pray then for not just them, but for one another, thinking of these beginnings, thankful that the Lord will bear fruit. So that means He's not done with the gospel work in your life. And that is really good to remember when we pray. Especially we have concerns for brothers and sisters. We're concerned. They're real concern. And I need to start and just know God's not done with you. The gospel work will continue. There's fruit going to happen here, God. Thank you. And it is good for us and emboldens our faith to remember that He's not done. It hasn't kind of run its course. It's not like the gospel works, it's kind of run its course. Right? It's run its course maybe in your marriage, in your singleness, in your parenting, in your purity, right? in your valleys, in your loss, in your old age, in your new school year. It hasn't run its course. And he's thanking the Lord, it's going to bear fruit. It's going to bear fruit, and so he always is praying thankful for this. So again, we will always pray thankful for this. You're living for Christ, you're beginning with Christ, and then finally, you're learning of Christ. You're learning of Christ. Always thankful for that. Look at verse 7. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our fellow, or sorry, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Or, some translations say, our behalf. Both works quite well. If it's, if it's your behalf, then he's saying, look, Epaphras came and he was a direct benefit to you. Epaphras came and he directed, he directly benefited Redemption Church Colossae. Maybe that's what they call themselves. That would be really cool. They probably did, actually. It's a great name, right? But he says Epaphras was a benefit directly to you, church. Or, if it's a benefit, like our benefit, then he's saying it's directly benefiting Paul, like himself, he's saying in Timothy. It's shared ministry. He says, Epaphras is a beloved servant, a slave, a slave to Christ. And the work is getting done. He says, this is the benefit to our work. So both ways work. We have Pastor Chris here from Redemption Red Deer. Other pastors preach in the pulpit, not from just Redemption Churches, by the way, too. Happened to be from there. He's a good friend of mine. And man, I was, I was, I was, I think I was drilling that nail so hard that I did have one person say, like, they apologized because they weren't going to be here and they're going to be in Red Deer because I was preaching in Red Deer. And they said, I know you want us to hear other people. So it's good. I, you know, but I'm going to be there, sorry. I'm like, well, you don't have to apologize. But, but what a joy to have another voice, a fellow servant who's preaching to you for your benefit. For the benefit of the church, I just prayed for you that you would just grow and our church would grow and praying for Chris. Just so thankful for someone that would preach the word of God and partner with me, but then also your benefit. But if I'm honest, there's still in that just to be really honest, a temptation, it's embarrassing, towards jealousy, towards wishing, man, I, I hope if something happens that, that I was there, or that it came from me, to be honest. The flesh is ugly. 
And parents, I wonder too, if the temptation is there, you know, you're, you're thinking about, yes, thankful for learning in Christ. You're thinking about your kids. Yes, this will happen. But if you're honest, you're making sure it happens from you. And yes, it needs to happen from you, but you know what I mean. Only you. All the credit to you. I remember like our kids growing up, even just so, like with walking and stuff, you'd leave the kid with, with the grandparent, you're like, don't teach them how to walk while I'm gone. Even if they can do it, sit them down. That's my job. Right? And there's that temptation to be like, anything of spiritual value, I want the credit. Like, God forgive us, right? Friends, same thing. Man, I want to lead that guy. I, I want to do that. It's like, man, pray thankful that God will do it. Just be thankful the learning will happen in Christ. And want that so desperately. And be praying thankful for it. For your brothers and sisters. So, what they learned from Epaphras is interesting. You can see it there. It was the same thing. I don't know if you noticed this. What they learned? Was it like, whoa, that's like, that's so new and strange. I've never heard of it before. No. It was the same thing. They were learning what they heard and what had come to them and what they understood. The gospel. It never changed. All they were doing was just learning and putting deeper roots into that. And then the result was fruit. And the primary result, you can see it there, and that's how it ends. It was love. It was love for one another. That was the primary result of this fruit. Of learning the gospel and how it applies to life. It was verse 8, and has made known to us. So Epaphras has passed on this news, your love in the Spirit. And as much as you'd like to take credit, temptation-wise, to be like, I added something to my salvation, or look what I did for that person, you can't. And as much as you can't take any credit for gospel work in your life, being a saint in Christ, you also can't for your love for one another. If we have a love for one another, it will be from God. He says, in the Spirit, this is clearly a love that is supernatural from God. And so that's how he ends. And that's how I want to end our time. And again, maybe with a couple questions. This is how Paul prays always for the believers. But don't forget that he is greatly concerned for this church, and he should be. The authority of Christ is being undermined, questioned. Others are gaining ground. That's not theirs anyhow. And he has a right to be really concerned, yet he starts with thankfulness. He starts with it. So, and again, to be clear, and if I haven't been clear, I hope I have been, it's thankfulness really for the gospel. The gospel work in the lives of brothers and sisters. That is a good place for me to start. I need to pray that way. We just forget. We just move beyond. And so my question would be uh, this kind of applicational and closing. So, uh, how are you praying for those in the church, Redemption Church? If this is your home church, how are you praying when you're concerned and when you're not? But does it model this? And I'm going to tell you this, as I've been trying to do this, it's going to take some work. You know, you get just like in a habit of prayer. Kids will bug you sometimes, like maybe Grace. They're like, I know exactly what you're going to say. We get that way as we pray for one another. This is like a reorientation to be like, no, we need to... Let's think about what we're praying. And then for those outside the church, the same. And just think, how am I praying for them? And again, especially for those that you're concerned. So praying again, thankful for their living for Christ, beginning with Christ, and then learning of Christ. And ultimately, as we'll see in this whole letter, Christ is over us. Christ over us. Amazing. Let me pray, and then we will worship in a final song together. So let me pray. Father, we praise you for who you are. You are worthy of all of our praise. We're thankful even now that we can sing as a church aloud to you in worship. So, Father, help us even to do that. Lord, I pray that you would help us to pray for one another. Would we be a praying church, Lord, expectant, dependent, and Lord, what a help today from your word, Lord, showing us how to pray thankful, just like a pump the brakes, pause, okay, what is really true here? for my brother and sister and to pray that. And so, Father, I pray that it would help us to not only pray, but then 
would result in fruit. Help us to know how to pray when we're concerned and result in fruit, and ultimately your glory and our good. So help us to be this praying church, Lord. Apply your word, I pray again, as always. Anything that was, you know, of me, just, Lord, would it be forgotten or just fall away? Like, Lord, and anything that was of you, would you just by your spirit be merciful to us, Lord, grow our church, apply it all to your glory. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.